Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 107. Psalm 107, our text for this morning, is found in verse 33 to verse 41. Psalm 107, verse 33 to verse 41. He turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes, and causeth them to wander in the wilderness, where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction, and maketh him families like a flock. Amen. We've been working through Psalm 107 over the past number of weeks, the various images that the Lord gives here, picturing the life of his redeemed people in the world. Verse 1 and verse 2, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And then we have numerous pictures and illustrations of experiences that we might have of God's, as God's people. For the last time we were looking at the picture of a man who is in a ship in the midst of a storm. He's at the mercy of the waves. His balance has gone. He's at the end of his resources, even at his wit's end. And from that position of distress, he cries unto the Lord. And in loving kindness, the Lord hears the cry of this poor man and delivers him. As with all the other examples, we come to the Lord in such an experience with much praise and thanksgiving. There in verse 31, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works unto the children of men. So we were at sea. The rise and the fall of the waves was uh, representative of many of the experiences that we go through as Christians. When we come to verse 33 to verse 41, this picture in one way continues, although it broadens. It's not unlike what we've considered being at sea in the midst of the storm in that there's motion. It's almost like the sea as the tide comes in and then the tide goes out again. Or like the waves that take us up and then cast us down. Because what we have in our text this morning is really a series of reversals. We move from fruitfulness to barrenness. We move from barrenness to fruitfulness. We're brought low and then lifted up or we're lifted up and then brought low. When you read these words, there is an immediate application to Israel's history. God did these things in their experience as they walked with him or as they turned aside from him. They went through these reversals throughout their history. And as that's the case for Israel in the Old Testament, likewise, we find it to be so for the church and also for the Christian in the New Testament period. So with the Lord's help this morning, we're looking at verse 33 to verse 41, and we want to focus upon ups and downs in the life of God's redeemed. Now, the first of these is that fruitful, the fruitful are made barren. Look at verse 33 and verse 34. In verse 33, it's written, He turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground. <coughs> Two statements in one verse, they're parallel. They're really emphasizing exactly the same thing. Rivers which are representative of life and vitality are turned into the desert, which is representative of death. 
water springs and fountains become dry and arid ground. Then in verse 34, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. So now we have productive pasture land, a place of fertility. That's being transformed into a place of barrenness, or literally the word here is saltiness. You might think of that region in and around the Dead Sea. The Israelite would have thought of that. You go down into that region, and as we noted a number of weeks ago, nothing grows. Nothing grows in that area. This is a sea of death. Verse 34 says, well, the Lord takes a fruitful land, a land that's fertile, and he turns it into a land of barrenness and saltiness. Now, as you look at these two verses, what you will also note is that there are two destroyers. I mean by that, that this experience is brought on by two causes. What's the first? Well, you'll note that the first is God. God is the cause of this experience. Look at verse 33. He, he turneth rivers into a wilderness. Look at verse 34, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. Verse 35, he turneth. So it's God here in verse 34 who's turning the fruitful into barrenness. God can do this in many ways. The Old Testament is replete with examples. God can do it through the experience of war. He can bring an invading army into a nation and they're like a plague of locusts. They leave nothing behind them. If you were to go to France today, the northern regions, in and around the Somme, over into Belgium and Ypres, you would find beautiful green pasture land, a very productive area. But were you to go back 100 years, you would see these same areas and nothing is growing. War had ravaged these places. Nothing was planted, but beyond that, war had raped the land and left these fertile fields like barren mudflats. Famine can do it as well. 150 years or more ago in Ireland, a little potato blight gets into the crop Upon, most, upon which most of the people depended and tens of thousands of people begin to die. Tens of thousands more get on ships and come to this place. Famine. Drought as well. God can stop the heavens. You may know a little of that here sometimes in the summer you get warnings that you're going to suffer periods of drought, but yet this region still is a very fertile region. Remember in the Old Testament how God did this in the days of Elijah. Elijah came before King Ahab and he said, God's not going to send rain for three years, and neither he did. The northern kingdom of Israel suffers under the hand of God through drought. Would you turn please in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 50? Isaiah chapter 50 verse 2 where God tells us that he's able to do this. Which on the one hand is a warning but interestingly it's an encouragement to trust in him because he has power to save. Isaiah chapter 50 in verse 2 Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, there was none to answer. Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stinketh, because there is no water, and dieth for thirst. Now that's casting us back into what God did in Egypt. He sent plagues. 
But the point is this. God has power to save. He demonstrates it in that he has power over everything. He also has power to destroy. And in our text this morning, Psalm 107, verse 33 and verse 34, God is the destroyer. It's God who's making the fruitful barren. But the second cause is found at the end of verse 34. A fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. God is the destroyer, but God destroys because of your sin. Didn't he warn Israel about this? We were looking midweek at Deuteronomy and we mentioned Deuteronomy chapter 28 and how it's foundational to the history that follows and the, the message that the prophets were bringing. Because God is prosecuting his law before his people. He says, if you walk in my ways, blessing will follow. If you turn aside, the curses of the covenant are going to fall upon you. Well, what were they? Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 15. But it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now listen to verse 23 and verse 24. And by heaven that is over thy head shall be brass and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. In other words, there's going to be no rain and nothing is going to grow. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. God did this. God takes them into Canaan. He says, it's a land of milk and honey. The spies bring back this report. You want to see how fruitful the land is. Here are the grapes of Eshcol. And yet Israel go in and start behaving like the Canaanites and God turns the land of milk and honey into a land of death and barrenness. He does it, brethren, because of the unbelief and covenant unfaithfulness of his people. Because they go into the land, forget God, abuse his mercies, and God says very well, I'm going to reverse things here. I'm going to make your fruitful experience barren. Now, I no doubt that is specific to Israel. Deuteronomy 28, 29 pertains to Israel's life in the land of Canaan. But in a general way, it's also true of all nations. Because God is king of all the earth and he hates sin everywhere that he finds it. What you'll find when you read older writers is that they were keenly aware of this and they looked for the hand of God in providence, especially in national judgments. And when they saw it, they called the nation to consider themselves and their faithfulness before God. In 1865, a foot and mouth uh, outbreak uh, occurred in the United Kingdom. And so many of the cattle were ultimately destroyed because of this. J.C. Ryle took up his pen and he wrote a tract entitled, This is the Finger of God. The words we find back in Exodus when Pharaoh recognized that indeed it was God who was judging. This is the finger of God. A few years ago in the UK, we had another outbreak of foot and mouth and Christians tried to say this and the whole culture ridiculed the church and laughed at us. Or if you think back to the 20th century, the bloodiest century in the history of humanity, and you start asking questions, why did these things occur? 1914 to 1918, the First World War. 1939 to 1945, another world war. On the back of that, and during that period in the Soviet Union, a massacre, genocidal mayhem. 
are we to live as atheists to imagine that evil has come into the city and somehow God is divorced from it all? Is it not interesting to see that the second half of the 19th century in Germany gave us people like Karl Marx, Nietzsche, all of the higher criticism was born in the German schools, the same Germany who gave us Martin Luther and the Reformation. And on the back of that, bang, God gives us a massacre. Liberalism infects the churches. The nations start to cast off the righteousness of God's law. They still don't learn. God gives us another world war. The communist ideologies that these people pr pr produced in the late 19th century caused 120 million deaths in the 20th century. Brethren, that is the finger of God. Financial crises hits the Western world. Nobody thinks that God's in it, but he is. He's shaking all of our confidence and our idol idolatrous pursuit of possessions in this life. We need to recognize these things. They should also make us shudder because the moral chaos and the trajectory that our nation is presently on forces us to ask the question, what's ahead? Many of these things are judgments from God. He gives us what we want, but then he'll just apply judgment upon judgment for the sins of the nations that forget God. This is a biblical reality. God deals with nations like this. And God deals with churches like this as well. The application from Israel to the church is far more consistent than from Israel to the nations of the earth. Because Israel were the covenant people of God. They turned from God. God turned their fruitfulness into barrenness. We, the Israel of God today, will find that God works upon exactly the same principle. It's not like he was judgment in the Old Testament and mercy in the New Testament. He's judgment and mercy in both. The New Testament warns us to behold both the goodness and the severity of God. And here we are, the church in the 21st century, and we plow and we sow and we labor, and it's like the heaven is as brass and the earth underneath us is as iron. Waking up, God is in that. God is in it. And when we experience this, it's time for the church to humble themselves before God and say, Lord, is it because of the wickedness of them that dwell therein? Is it because of our sins that you've turned our former fruitfulness into barrenness? Is it because we're like Laodicea and we think that we're rich and in need of nothing and we don't understand that we're wretched and poor and miserable and blind and naked? Lord, you deal with churches like this just as you dealt with Israel like this. And you deal with individuals like this as well. Didn't we sing of it in David's experience? And I emphasize that Paul takes Psalm 32 and applies it to the New Testament church in Romans chapter 4. What happens when a Christian holds on to, his, holds on to sin in his life? God turns all of his moisture, all of his fruitfulness into drought and barrenness. God can do it outwardly in your life. 
because of your sins, God can take from you the things that you seem most assured of in life. He can make your business unprofitable. He can make your employment miserable. He can waste your finances. He can spoil your possessions. He can take your health <coughs> to chasten you for your sins. And then he can do it inwardly. He can bring famine to your soul. Even when you're flourishing outwardly. Like Israel who said, give us flesh to eat. We're not satisfied with your manna. Give us quails, God said very well. And he gave them what their hearts desired. And then he sent leanness into their souls. You can be prospering outwardly and perishing inwardly. God can take your experience, which was formerly fruitful as a Christian, and he can just bring death and dryness into it. At that point, you lift up your eyes to heaven and you say, Lord, if it's for my sins, show me my sins. He can take a ministry. The labor of a pastor who had seen much blessing in former days, and he can take that fruitful ministry and he can make it barren. Do you detect these things in your own life this morning? Do you detect them? You know, it's sad that some professing Christians haven't a clue what's going on in their own lives. They don't even perceive fruitfulness. They don't even perceive barrenness. It's like they're walking through their Christian experience numb. Do you detect this this morning? Do you know what it is to have dearth in your soul? Do you know what it is to have dried up devotions? Do you know what it is that all the fruit of the Spirit in your life is dried up and shriveled and rotting? Verse 34, God turns a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He does it because of our sins. So maybe the Lord has a controversy with us this morning. Maybe the Lord has a controversy with you as an individual Christian this morning. It's a probing question. Well, thank the Lord in the second place. Not only does he make the fruitful barren, but there's wonderful hope here because there's another reversal. He makes the barren fruitful. In verse 35, you have the reverse of verse 33 and verse 34. Verse 35 reads, He turneth the wilderness into standing water and dry ground into water springs. Now where there's barrenness and deadness, He brings life and vitality. Then verse 36 to verse 38 develops this theme develops it in terms again of the book of Deuteronomy. And he says there, And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation, and sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. So he's making the barren fruitful. Now there's an image like, what Israel experienced when they returned from captivity. It's like the homeless are finding their home again and the hungry are being fed because God is blessing the labors of their hands once more. Like Psalm 126, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. It's the prophetic imagery of God's blessing returning again to his people. Well, we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, don't we? There at the beginning of the chapter, God says, if you obey me, what will the result of that be? But fruitfulness. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And from the beginning, 
And it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, that thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kine, and the flocks of thy sheep, and so on. So in verse 33 and verse 34, it's covenant curses because of the unfaithfulness of God's people. But now in these verses, 35 through verse 38, they're enjoying the blessings of the covenant for faithfulness to God in it. Now we don't make a one-to-one -one correlation. Israel are pro promised all this outward prosperity. Therefore, we are to look for outward prosperity. What does God promise to bless us with as we walk before him in covenant faithfulness? Outward things, yes, they will follow. But ultimately things like joy, fullness of joy, love, peace of conscience, unity in the church of Christ, spiritual prosperity. In verse 33 and verse 34, we noted that there were two destroyers mentioned, God and sin. What's significant here is that there's only one restorer identified. Now keep in your mind, we've just said covenant faithfulness is important. We walk in the ways of the Lord and the Lord blesses us. But is it not interesting to you this morning that when God states this reversal here, there is no cause given but himself. So at the end of verse 34, we're told that he does it for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. But in verse 35 to verse 38, it's just, he did it, he did it, he did it. Yes, the inhabitants are doing things. They're sowing and they're planting and all the rest of it. But the work is God's. The work is God's. He turns the wilderness into a standing water. He makes the hungry to dwell. He blesseth them also so that they are multiplied greatly. I want you to see something here. The judgment of God comes upon us from God for our sin. The blessing of God comes upon us from God by his grace. The blessing of God comes upon us from God by his grace. Not that we aren't to walk in covenant faithfulness to him. But listen, all of our covenant faithfulness and obedience does absolutely nothing to merit the favor and blessing of God. His response to it is still gracious, always gracious. Surely that's being emphasized to us here in this portion. So if God blesses a nation, he blesses that nation in his grace. They may have better industry than other nations. You compare this country to Africa, you'll see that. So there's an obvi obvious natural cause there. Africa is never going to be as productive as America as things currently stand. He may, he may give us wiser rulers. Now, I know you say, well, wait a minute. We look at our rulers and, and we seem to see so much stupidity. But let's put it in context. You could live in Venezuela. Yeah. You ought to be thankful for the economic wisdom that still exists in this country. So you've got all of these natural things. You've got all of the heritage that has come down to us. But the blessings that have come upon this nation and, and any nation that receives them come by the grace of God. God could easily blow up our economic system. 
God could cause all those prairies out in the Midwest that produce so much of the grain and produce of this country. He could just blight it in a moment. He could stop the heavens. He could send us drought. He could send famine and food shortages. And yet we live in this nation with outward blessings and abundance. We need to trace that to the hand of God. You know, you sit down at meal times and you say, Lord, thank you for this food. And there you are recognizing the first cause. But how does it get to hear from there? That's an interesting thing to think about. How does it get from here to there? God doesn't just drop your food from the sky, does he? No. You think of the process to get that vegetable upon your plate. Somebody had to plow the ground. Somebody had to sow the seed. Somebody had to tend for the plants. Somebody had to reap the harvest. Somebody had to box the produce. Somebody had to transport it uh, to, to Walmart or wherever you get it from. Somebody had to put it out on the display. The people need to work in that place. Your parents or yourself, you have to go out and earn your crust by working somewhere else to get the money to go and pay for that food. All under the blessing of God. If God blesses nations, it's all of grace. If God blesses his church, it's all of grace. Now again, there are means that God uses. There's instrumentality. You come here, you listen to the word of God, you seek God's face in prayer. But all of that would be like iron earth without the blessing of the Lord. Let's return to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we read earlier. Because we read it for this reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. The Corinthians are carnal. They have a party spirit. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. And Paul is saying, you know, wise up. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? What can these guys do? Verse 6. I have planted Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Paul says, I'm just a sower of seed. As for Apollos, he's got a watering can. He just comes along, puts a little bit of water upon the seed, nothing else. He can't make that seed germinate. Once germinated, he can't feed it, he can't make it grow. He's not in control of its fruitfulness. But God is. God is. If God blesses a church, listen, it's all of grace. Now what a wonderful picture of spiritual revival we find here in verse 35. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell that they might prepare a city for habitation and sow fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also. As I said earlier, it's taken up in the prophets frequently an image of spiritual reviving and increase. God making the barren fruitful. God restoring the broken and healing it. God populating the city. (laughs) Brethren, this is what happens when Christ comes in power and with blessing to the church. Just think of Isaiah 35. What will Messiah do when he comes? The wilderness will blossom like a rose. The fruitful field will become a forest. The blind will receive their sight. The deaf will hear. The lame will leap. The tongue of the dumb shall sing. 
These images, they're put together. The spiritual blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ bringing fruitfulness to that which was barren. The gospel penetrating all nations as streams in the desert and life coming where there was only death before. How we desire this as a church. We desire to be fruitful. We want to see the fruit of the Spirit of God flourish in the lives of each member of this congregation. We want to be fruitful that we as the bride of Christ in this place would bear sons to the glory of God. We want to see streams going out into the desert of our surrounding community and men and women and children passing from death into life. The culture renovated because the souls of men are transformed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, this is what we earnestly desire. But listen, we do not deserve it. It's all of grace. And if he restores a barren soul, then it's all of grace as well. Now remember the challenge of the first point. Don't let it go away. Has God transformed fruitfulness in your life into barrenness? While you get down to searching your heart and trying to discover if it is for any sin that you need to confess. But understand this also. You cannot restore yourself. You can use the means and you're wise to do that. But in the use of the means, brethren, you must seek the blessing of Almighty God. Because these people in this psalm could have gone out and sowed and ploughed and sowed and ploughed. And the heaven be as brass and the earth be as iron. He blesseth them also. Now you say my soul is dried up and barren this morning. Are you concerned about it? Here's the proof of your concern. You will go to God in the use of the means of grace, the reading and preaching and hearing of God's word, prayer, the Lord's table, when you have opportunity to do that. And you will go to these things not mechanically, but seeking the blessing of God with intensity. Knowing that He alone is able to send the rivers of living water into your heart and to make things grow again. He makes the fruitful barren. Praise God, he makes the barren fruitful as well. Thirdly, humbled and exalted. Another reversal. In verse 39, what has expanded, sadly, contracts again. What has been lifted up is brought low. Verse 39, again, they are minished or diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. Verse 40 tells us he can do this to all men. None of our are out of his reach. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Think about it. Here you are and you depend upon God for everything. Everything in your life practically and spiritually. But it's so also for those that God exalts to high positions of authority, kings and princes. They depend upon God for everything and they depend upon God for the right and ability to rule. And God can take this away from them. He can pour his contempt. He can make them to wander in the wilderness. Well, did he do it? You need only think of what he did in the book of Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. 
There he is, puffed up with pride, the emperor of all the, uh, this vast em empire, taking all the glory to himself, and God says, well, Nebuchadnezzar, we've got to teach you a lesson here. <coughs> what did he do with that seemingly almighty king? He sent them out into the field in a fit of madness to eat grass like a cow. Until the great Nebuchadnezzar would come to confess that there is none like God. He ruleth in the armies of, of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and there is none that can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Oh, in providence he lifted Nebuchadnezzar up, but then he brought him crashing down again. Well, he can do that with kings. He can do that with presidents. He can do that with nations. He can do that with you and with me. But then verse 41, he's able to lift the poor and the afflicted. He setteth the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. He's able to exalt them and prosper them once again. Verse 40, they're in a solitary place. Verse 41, they're sitting there as a flock. It's as if they are with their families again. Do you see what's going on in these verses? The proud are being brought low. The poor are being lifted up. The proud who are all self-sufficient thinking, I'm in control and my hand has got me all these things. God humbles them. The poor man who knows that he has nothing but comes like the beggar in the street with stretched out hands saying to those who have something, please, can you give me? The man who comes in poverty of spirit like that before God is the one that God exalts. Doesn't the Bible tell you that pride comes before a fall? Take heed to that. You're puffed up in heart, blinded even by God's blessings. You forget him. God brings you crashing down. But it's also true that this kind of poverty of spirit comes before a gracious exaltation. This poor man cried. God heard and saved him from all of his distresses. Isn't that what Jesus teaches us in his life and by his example. Didn't Jesus emphasize this so many times, even to his disciples? Those that exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. And they had a living illustration of it right before their eyes. He who humbled himself to take our nature, live our life and die our death. Even the curse of death of the cross. God highly exalts him and gives him a name which is above every name. These are the things that are set before you here in verse 39 through verse 41. He's able to take the proud and cast them down. He's able to take the poor and lift them up. The history of the church is full of examples like this. Why does God take Israel into captivity but to purge them and break them and to bring them back to himself in words like the book of Lamentations when they confess their sins and return again unto the Lord? It's like the church rides the crest of the wave and therein becomes complacent. And God brings them down in their complacency through affliction and oppression. But he does it in order to preserve them and to lift them up. Do you see when you see these reversals throughout history? Israel going down into Egypt, God preserving them there. God bringing them into the land and they turn away and God brings them back. They turn away, God brings them back. It's a millennia long demonstration to you that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Christ. Because everyone outside the church is trying to destroy it and all of us fools inside are often doing our best to destroy it. 
and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ keeps marching on. These reversals, he brings us low to lift us up. He brings us low to restore us. And so it is in your own Christian life. We wish it were not so. We wish we had just one continual, constant trajectory of upwardness in the Christian life. But we don't. God brings us down and often he does it for sin. God lifts us up and he always does it by his grace. But why do you keep going? Why do you keep going in the Christian life? Because the gates of hell will not prevail against you as a Christian. Because God has chosen you in Christ unto yourself. So yes, the trajectory is up. But it's like that. Up and down, up and down, upwards. This is the experience of the redeemed of the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes the fruitful barren. He makes the barren fruitful. He humbles the proud and he exalts the lowly. May God bless his word to all of our hearts for Jesus' sake. Let's stand for prayer.